to you our speaker today, and then she will have the floor for about 45 minutes, and she will tell, tell you all about um, her book. So, Madame um, La Présidente Micheline Calmeret uh, studied political science at the University of Geneva. She was a member of the Grand Council, that is the legislature of the Canton of Geneva between 1981 and 1997. She, is, she was a state councillor, um, which is the executive of the Canton of Geneva between 1997 and two 2002. And she served then from, 2000, uh, from December 2002 and, and uh, beginning from 2003, she served as federal councillor until 2011. Um, Madame Calmire was serving then as the head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, which is Switzerland's equivalent of a foreign minister, although Switzerland doesn't do ministries, Switzerland does federal departments, it's nearly the same, but we always do things slightly differently than everybody else. And then she also served as president of Switzerland two times in 2007 and in 2011. The presidency of Switzerland is a um, is a, uh, is a rotating is a rotating affair, and as such, um, Madame Calmire was a uh, was a primus inter pares, and she um, she served Switzerland so for a total of eight years. And if you allow me to read one of uh, her um, biographical entries about her time in um, at the helm of the Swiss executive. She pursued an active foreign policy marked by a commitment to broadening and developing relations between Switzerland and the European Union by strengthening and enhancing bilateral relations. She also promoted Switzerland outside of Europe, particularly in Asia and Africa, and pursued a policy of active neutrality by promoting peace, fostering respect for human rights, and advancing the fight against poverty. Notable achievements of this policy include the launch of the Geneva Initiative, the creation of the Human Rights Council, um, mediations between Armenia and Turkey, as well as Georgia and Russia, and lastly, the adoption of the third additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions, which allowed the um, Magan David Adom, the Israeli Red Cross, so to speak, to enter the International Federation of Red Crosses and Red Crescent Societies. Uh, currently, Madame Calmire is serving um, as professor uh, at the University of Geneva, and again, uh, in just last year, she published this book, and she will now tell us all about it. Um, Madame la Présidente Calmire, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me first uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Pascal Lotta, who organizes this event, and um, this event that gives me the opportunity to talk, to address you, and to talk about neutrality, the implementation of neutrality by Switzerland, uh, its evolution, its interest, and its evolution today. Um, so I will I, I, I will talk so about uh, three quarters of an hour. Uh, don't hesitate if you have questions to interrupt me <laughs> during my during my presentation. What I will begin with one question: What does it mean to be neutral today, after the Cold War? Neutral means neither in Latin. Neutrality is such a negative concept. It implies an attitude of renunciation. According to the doctrine of just war, developed at the time of the Crusades, it is considered a sign of egoism. How can one justify renouncing participation in a common effort of a just war against unbelievers? But gradually, the distancing from this medieval doctrine allows a more positive connotation of neutrality. It takes on the garb of impartiality, the neutrality of a judge applying the law. Such a meaning is not based on indifference, but in fact on decision-making. It paves the way for active neutrality by focusing on international and commercial relationships, respect of international law, multilateralism, democracy, human rights, prevention and resolution of conflicts, through committed policies. The fifth convention concluded at the peace conference in The Hague in 1907, lists the rights and obligation of a neutral state. In fact, the benefit of constantly questioning what neutrality 
prohibits or permits is very relative. The rules of neutrality apply only to situations of war between states. And even then, they contain a few restrictions. The neutral state may not participate militarily in a conflict between other states. In particular, it is forbidden to support the warring parties with war material or troops. Neutral states are also prohibited from making their territory, including the airspace, available for belligerents for military purposes. In addition, the neutral state must be able to defend its territory militarily to prevent its territory from being used from the belligerents for military purposes, such, um, such as the transit of troops or the establishment of military bases. One of the basic conditions for the application of the law of neutrality is the existence of an international armed conflict. This means on one hand, that the conflict is between states and not between a state and a non-state actor. Otherwise the conflict would be characterized, characterized as an internal conflict. On the other hand, it must be an armed conflict. A political conflict is not sufficient for the application of the neutrality right. Switzerland is a permanent neutral state. Also the neutrality right does not explicitly define the rights and the obligation and the obligations of a permanent neutral state. Permanent neutrality nevertheless entails certain obligations arising from the principle of goodwill and trust. That's a permanent neutral state may not enter into obligations in peacetime that make it impossible for it to fulfill its duties as a neutral state. This includes the prohibition of entering into a military or defense alliance or authorizing the establishment of military bases on its territory. This explains why Switzerland is not a member of the NATO. And since the obligations and restrictions defined by the neutrality right apply exclusively to the military sphere, they do not affect the neutral state's other activities. The neutral state may therefore pursue a foreign and security policy consistent with its national interest. Swiss neutrality has, has evolved over time, you see. Let me explain what happened in 2002 when Swiss neutrality undergoes a paradigm shift with Switzerland's entry to the United Nations and thus joining the United Nations collective security system. At the heart of the collective security system is a prohibition of war. The Charter of the United Nations establishes from the outset the principle that I quote, members of the United Nations shall refrain from the threat or use of force against territorial integrity or political independence. However, the Charter recognizes the right of states to self-defense. Members of the organization undertake to observe the provisions of his charter and to fulfill the obligations arising therefrom. Chapter six and seven deal with a peaceful settlement of disputes and action on threats to the peace, breaches of the peace and acts of aggression. Article 33 states that the parties to a dispute, the continuation of which may jeopardize the maintenance of international peace and security, shall seek a solution in the first instance through negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, recourse to national institutions, to regional institutions or arrangements or other peaceful means of that choice. Chapter seven addresses binding measures that may take the form of sanctions, peacekeeping or peacemaking. I quote, the Security Council shall determine the existence of a threat to the peace, a breach of the peace or an act of aggression and shall make recommendations or decide what measures to take to maintain or restore international peace and security. You know, the body with the highest responsibility for peace, for peace uh, and security is the Security Council, whose role is defined as follows. In order to ensure prompt and effective action by the organization, its members entrust to the Security Council the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, 
and recognize that the Security Council in carrying out its duties and thus its responsibility acts on my behalf. By joining the United Nations in 2002, Switzerland formally recognized the authority of the Security Council. Hence, the resolutions adopted by the Council in carrying out its mission to maintain peace and security and are therefore binding on Switzerland, including with regard to the so-called economic sanctions and under exceptional cases in which the Council, the Council would decide to use force. Thus, the neutrality of member states is compatible with the United Nations Charter. The organization is not a military alliance, nor it is a belligerent party. The Security Council acts on the basis of the mandate of all member states as a guardian of the world order responsible for maintaining and restoring peace. The unarmed coercive measures it takes under Chapter 7 against the state that threatens or breaches the peace do not constitute acts of war within the meaning of the law of neutrality, but, but are intended to remind the state to respect the obligations to which it freely agreed by acceding to the Charter. Therefore, neutrality does not apply to unarmed coercive measures taken by the Security Council. But, and this is a crucial point, the rules of neutrality also do not apply to military actions authorized by the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the Charter. Such actions are not defined as being a war between states, which would entail the application of the neutrality right. They are decided by the Security Council on behalf of the international community in order to restore international peace and security, which means that the law of neutrality does not prohibit the neutral state from participating in coercive military action by the Security Council. In short, the law of neutrality does not apply to military actions by the United Nations Security Council under Chapter 7 of the Charter, except for the limitations provided by the law of a neutral state. Switzerland, for example, has adopted such limitations. The Swiss soldiers cannot participate in peace enforcing measures. It is forbidden by the Swiss law. On the other hand, in the absence of the Security Council resolution authorizing military action, the conflict is an armed conflict between states of the conventional type. In such a case, all the rights and obligations associated with the status of a neutral state must be applied. An example, in 2003, Switzerland prohibits states involved in the second war in Iraq from flying military aircraft over its territory before and during the conflict. It prohibits any delivery of federal military material to the parties to the conflict and makes the export of military material from the federal armament company, RUAG, and from Swiss private companies to countries linked to the conflict subject to approval so that no Swiss made war material can be used in the field. Now, Switzerland is a candidate for a non-permanent seat in the Security Council. Perhaps you would ask, is that compatible with the status of a neutral permanent neutral state like Switzerland? UN Security Council membership and neutrality, how does this fit together? Arguments against Swiss security membership are readily available. The veto, the dominance of the big players, the Council's division in crisis like Syria, like, like in the Middle East now. <laughs> and above all, the Security Council decides on war and peace. Yes, it does, but very rarely. By the end of 2019, the UN Security Council had adopted around 2,500 resolutions. In four cases, did it authorize the use of armed forces, which led to major military operations. That means 0.002% of all Security Council resolutions 
but in the vast majority of situations, the council does not act militarily, but politically. If in exceptional cases, it nevertheless authorized military interventions, the Security Council, which is otherwise criticized for its disunity, acts unisono and on behalf of the international community. This is precisely what makes the essential difference to the classic interstate conflict to which neutrality applies. That's the difference with the decision of a Security Council. Since Switzerland has a reputation in the UN for advocating independently, factual and consensus space, its voice is valued, valued and taken seriously. I am in favor of Switzerland's candidacy for the Security Council because I myself launched the candidacy of Switzerland in 2011, convinced of its usefulness in expanding our networks and thus our influence at the international level. The Security Council membership is both a challenge and an opportunity to play our part in peace, justice, and stability in the world with a, with a healthy dose of realism, but also with the necessary self-confidence. In the end, we also benefit from this. Certainly, the Security Council is far from being perfect, but we only have this one. And um, our standing aside does not make it any better. Um, I would like to now speak about the praxis of neutrality uh, and, uh, and the challenges the neutrality is facing today. The first challenge, conflicts are changing in nature. As difficult as it is to decide what constitutes a war, this definition is necessary in order to decide on the application of the law of neutrality. Uh, it is then abrogated when the state of war has ended. Neutrality rights applies in case of an international war. That means a war between two states. But what happens when things get even more complicated? When states are not engaged in international conflict, but are fighting abroad? France, the US, Iran, Turkey, Israel, Russia have intervened in Syria, not to fight against another state, but against non-state armed groups. Actually, several armed um, conflicts overlap on the, on the one hand, Syria, Russia, and Iran are fighting against the Islamic State. On the other hand, France, UK, and US are coming to the aid of rebel groups fighting against the Syrian regime. Another example where the world war is used for several overlapping conflicts is Yemen. This is a civil war in which the Shiit Houthis face armed supporters of Yemen's ex-government baked by a coalition of around 10 countries led by Saudi Arabia. These conflicts do not constitute international interstate wars and do not give rise to recourse to the law of neutrality. We're not, Switzerland did not apply the right of neutrality in case of these conflicts. Nevertheless, one can ask whether the fact that Switzerland maintains close political and economic relationships with states involved in such conflicts is compatible with the principle of neutrality. But things can get even more complex with the digital revolution. The digital revolution is also shaking up the common definition of war. Meanwhile, the battlefield is expanding into cyberspace. At its summit in September 2014, NATO classified massive cyber attacks as acts of war that may be fought with military means. It must be conceded that the international legal order is not designed for such cases. In view of the narrowly limited applicability of the neutrality right, it is therefore not surprising that every foreign policy statement is immediately questioned as to whether it vi violates neutrality or not. Ultimately, the political authority must decide for themselves whether they regard terrorist attacks and cyber attacks as criminal acts to which the concept of war cannot be applied or acts of war. This is due to the decisions that uh, the, the political authority have to, have to take. 
Another challenge is the capacity of defense of the neutral state. A neutral country must be able to defend its territory. And this duty is difficult to implement. Up to what altitude does the overflight ban apply? Does it also apply to intercontinental missiles? Does the duty to defend go so far as to require equipping with a sophisticated missile defense shield? Does it need a guided missile and nuclear program like in North Korea to defend itself with military means against an external attack? In national defense, as in other areas, Switzerland relies on pragmatism. It has a militia army, air defense, and combat aircraft. Its goal is to be able to react if it is attacked. And the degree of security depends on a subjective threat analysis. For example, it seems very unlikely that a thermonuclear bomb will be dropped on Switzerland. That's why defense is not absolute, but relative and based on a risk analysis of the threats, it's subjective risk analysis. At the same time, Switzerland pays attention to an interoperable army. That means its ability to function with the armies of neighboring countries. In any case, Switzerland faces a great challenge of finding a balance between threats and military means and choosing its defense options accordingly. Nevertheless, given the budgetary constraints, it cannot do without international cooperation in security matters. Another challenge is the export of arms. At the heart of the law of neutrality is the prohibition on supplying war material or other war related goods to the parties to the conflict. How does Switzerland fulfill these obligations? The war material law generally prohibited the Swiss war material law generally prohibits its exports to states involved in an international armed conflict. However, Switzerland is very pragmatic in its application of these general principles of the law. And the issue of armed exports is particularly problematic when arms are exported in countries involved in conflicts such as Saudi Arabia. How well do arms exports fit fit with the genuine humanitarian tradition of Switzerland. A cynic would answer that after all, we host and finance a good Swiss institution, the ICARCA, the International Committee of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, the ICRC. The ICRC is active on the battlefields and to a certain extent, cleans up the mess made by weapons. I'm sorry to speak like that, but it is the truth. Therefore, it would be logical to systematically renounce arm exports if we really want to be a new, as neutral and philanthropic as we proclaim. This question is stirring public opinion in Switzerland, a popular initiative aimed at conquering the ban on arms exports to countries engaged in civil war or war warfare in the federal constitutions has been submitted to the federal chancellery. If the initiative is accepted, arms exports will be democratically controlled and the Federal Council will no longer be able to, design, to decide on them alone. As a challenge is a weakness of multilateralism. At the global level, the international organizations created after World War II multiply their activities through the deployment of hundreds of thousands of UN peacekeepers and civilian agents, but the functioning of these organizations does not reflect the distribution of power or the complexity of many global problems. Multilateralism, including its key elements, can survive as long as it transforms. In addition, the many international agreements whose purpose is to open up the world to the free flow of goods, services, ideas, and people are no longer look so promising. This shift has caused a public backlash against globalization in the United States, but also in many Western countries that has manifested itself in more nationalist and inward looking policies. As a result, the political will to defend the international order and multilateralism is in short supply. 
but turning back or even significant, significantly slowing down globalization in the foreseeable future is not possible to me. We live in a world in which global governance is becoming increasingly important, a world where even the most powerful state on earth cannot solve all problems alone because we face risks that know no border. Even the pandemic COVID-19, which has imposed rigid restrictions on some spe specific avenues of globalization, including international travel, has at the same time opened new routes for bringing humankind together. Among other things, the pandemic has illustrated that the world is getting smaller, more crowded, more complex, and more fragile. States have responded to these changes by initiating processes of economic and political integration at the regional level. But Switzerland is not, is alone. Switzerland is one of the most competitive and innovative countries in the world. How does it manage to ensure peace, welfare, and security for its nearly 9 million inhabitants, even though it is not an EU or NATO member? In order to be perceived as a player, our policies must come to terms with the emergence of global risks, assume more global responsibility, and ensure our defense. For this, neutrality is an instrument in our hands. You allow me to speak a little bit about history and afterwards about the European Union and neutrality of the European Union. A little bit of history. At the beginning of the 16th century, Switzerland was Europe's leading military power. If you believe that or not, it is the truth. <laughs> In 1512, it invaded Burgundy, led Siege to Dijon, imposed a peace agreement on the King of France. That same year, it occupied Lombardy and in 1513 won the Battle of Navarre. But the Swiss the reputation was the Swiss are invincible, but they were defeated two years later at Marignano. Dissensions between the alliances members, the canton, as well as the weakness of the central authority had made it impossible to adopt a common position on the number of soldiers to be provided by each of them. The alliance member had contributed on a voluntary basis without any quotas being imposed. In 1516, one year after the defeat, Switzerland signed a peace treaty with France. The Confederates thereby renounced the policy of military expansion. They negotiated bilateral treaties, first with France, later with the Habsburgs, Spain, Venice, reacted to external pressures, were flexible, got along with our partners, and at the same time stayed out of big politics. For more than 200 years, they adopted a foreign, politic of a foreign policy of restraint, which nevertheless cannot be described as a policy of withdrawal and closure. Switzerland sought to maintain its independence by keeping its distance from overly powerful neighbors. The approach can be described as pragmatic and adapted to circumstances. It is from such a policy that the notion of neutrality emerged in the 17th century as the Swiss drew the consequences of the situation. An alliance of small states, the canton, divided among themselves over their geostrategic interest and a weak central power that was more of a coordinating body than an institution in the, with real decision-making power. These historical facts remind me of a conference I attended a few years ago in my role as foreign minister. The subject of the discussion was the Middle East. And a European colleague noted the importance of the European financial aid in the occupied Palestinian territories, while deploring the lack of a strategic role for the European Union in resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And certainly you have noticed that things have not changed since the period of this, of this conference. As with the newborn confederation, divergent interests between member states and fragmented governance were at the root of the lack of success of European foreign policy 
despite the considerable sums of money allotted to it. The European Union status within the international community depends to a large extent on its contribution to the production of public goods and solving global problems. From this point of view, alliances and partnerships between states are fundamental in compensating for asymmetrical relationships, especially in the case of those who do not belong to the club of great powers, which is the case of the European Union. In order to ensure its security, the European Union needs a just world order. It is therefore necessary not only to look after one's relations with others, but also gain influence in multilateral fora where such an order is defined. However, the differences in interest between member states relegate the European Union to the role of a regional balance player at best. To an outside observer, the degree of mistrust between the East European states and all Europe on the issue of the distribution, distribution, for example, on the issue of the distribution of migrants is evident. And sometimes the Commission seems to be working to defend the interest of the two biggest member states rather than those of member states as a whole. Europe appears as a heterogeneous entity, playing it by ear. Consequently, its influence on world affairs remain limited. So why not change? Why not move towards a foreign policy that ensures its internal cohesion, as well as a more salient international profile? The question is, should the EU be made a neutral power, an independent and non-aggressive Europe between the blocs of China and the United States? The reasons in favor of such a shift in European policy are based on a few principles. First and foremost, the desire to respect the diversity of its components, its particularities and its values. What does this mean? The fact remains that one of the sources of Europe's weaknesses does not lie in divergences of interest and position between, pardon, does lie in divergences, divergences of interest and position between member states. Cohesion is therefore needed. At the time of disagreements, at the time of the Brexit, the question of the union's stability and harmony between its members remains open. Tensions between member states and the union's central governance is another contributing factor. States are keen to preserve their sovereignty in international affairs while Brussels wishes to expand its room to maneuver and become a major power. The European Union with its 27 members is experiencing the same difficulties of internal cohesion as Switzerland did in the course of its history and for the same reasons. Diversity management. It is an institutional model based on multi-belonging, a model which makes it difficult to determine an interest that is greater than the sum of individual interests at the, each state's individual interest. With the consequence that in many respects, the European Union's foreign policy looks like that of a neutral country. Now, today, directed to a good extent towards commercial relationships, multilateralism, humanitarian action, development aid and promotion of peace. Rather than being modes of defense or security guarantees, the uh, European Union's military actions are either humanitarian or complementary to those of the NATO. Only one member state, France, has an army capable of waging a real war. The European Union's foreign policy has been less active and less unified than the adoption of the Treaty of Lisbon in 2010 has led one to hope for. The European Union has little advantage in today's geopolitical competition. Confronted with the dual problems of governance and geopolitical positioning in a threatening world, the situation of the European Union is not unlike that of Switzerland. And the way in which Switzerland has tried to resolve it and to make use of the principle of neutrality from its origin to the present day. Switzerland has moved from a neutrality of necessity based primarily on a need for security to an active neutrality based on international law. Swiss neutrality has evolved 
it has adapted to the globalization of the issues at stake. Encored in the country's constitution, both permanent and flexible, the evolution is enshrined by its admission to the United Nations in 2002, and since then, by its candidacy for a seat of non-permanent representative in the Security Council. Prior to the French Revolution French and, and reform, the principles was not called into question. As a country with multiple languages and cultures like the European Union, neutrality has enabled it to strengthen its internal cohesion, while at the same time giving the rest of the world recognition for a predictable and useful foreign policy. Would my question <coughs> would as a conclusion, would the same causes produce the same effects? Considering the mechanism that led the young confederation to adopt a policy of neutrality, are we moving towards a neutral Europe in the long run? Extended to Europe, that would mean Europe would explicitly renounce to use force as an instrument for conflict resolution. When wars and conflicts multiply, when the fait accompli, becomes a way to govern, renouncing the pursuit of foreign policy goals by force and explicitly basing its policy on multilateralism and the respect of the rule of law will be courageous, but also effective. Europe would open new fields of action in the world. It could play an arbitration role in specific conflicts and position itself by more credibly promoting multilateralist mediation and the consideration of mutual interest. It would extend to concerns that environmental protection, the fight against corruption, terrorism. Here too, alongside its operational contributions, Europe would have an even greater capacity than today to bypass existing blocs in order to forge original alliances with trans-regional group of states. International conflict resolution and prevention, respect for international as well as addressing global concerns could be the cornerstone of a European foreign policy. It is safe to predict that the great divide in international relations will be between those countries or groups that can best adapt to an increasingly dynamic and insecure global environment. In this respect, active neutrality is an interesting concept for Europe because it incorporates both autonomy and participation. To be more concrete, either the European states agree to devolve their competences to, the higher, to a higher authority, which is unlikely, or the European states decide to agree on common policies, common policies that bring about unity, internal cohesion, and a recognizable profile in the international, on the international scene. The preamble to the German to the German law that Deutsche Grundgesetz obliges Germany to work for peace in a unified Europe, and therefore its choice is limited in matters of security. Either Germany preserves the status quo or fully supports a move towards a neutral European entity endowed with a European military deterrent force. Bearing this in mind, neutrality, in other words, a strategic autonomy, could be a serious option for Europe. Some people may take offense, feel insulted, but what is the point of trying to compare the policy of a power like the European Union, itself made up of large countries, including France with its nuclear power, with the policy of Switzerland, and above all, to defend the thesis of a neutral European policy. I do not propose to make the European Union a spectator of its destiny, to make it an isolated power entrenched within its border. Um, Francois Hollande, the former uh, president of France, who uh, prefaced my book in French, said, uh, I, my proposition uh, is to make Europe an ONG, a, a, a non-governmental organization. <laughs> uh, I, a European, what I would say, a European defense is not in contradiction with a neutralist posture. 
The hard core of neutrality is a desire for a non-violent policy based on the respect for law and rules applicable to all. The principle of neutrality does not imply a renunciation of the use of military force. A neutral state has an obligation to defend its territory. The only action it renounces is the aggressive use of force. That means participation in interstate warfare. Of course, neutrality obliges membership of an ally such as NATO or reciprocal military assistance obligations would be prohibited. But neutrality is not incompatible with a European defense, nor with a transnational approach to defense. A non-aggressive policy does not mean wanting to isolate, to isolate oneself. Active neutrality of, or in other words, strategic autonomy does not mean withdrawing behind, behind its borders. A neutral state or institution participates in operations, including military sanctions, decided by the United Nations or the OSCE, for example. This in the case of a neutral Sweden, this is the case of neutral Sweden and Austria, members of the European Union. A neutral European Union is a union powerful enough not to be forced to take sides under duress. A neutral European Union pursues a non-aggressive, non-violent policy, which means betting above all on so-called soft power. I can already hear those who in indignation will cry out that it is impossible in an unstable environment to renounce to pure, pure force. The fact remains that the distinction between soft and hard power, the distinction between diplomacy and military force has become archaic in the age of cyber attacks and global risks. A survey conducted in 2019 on behalf of the think tank European Council on Foreign Relations among 60,000 people in 14 European countries reveals that in half of the countries survived, respondents believe that Europe should remain neutral in the event of a conflict between the United States, China or Russia, choosing a middle way between competing major powers. In all member states, the majority of citizens favor neutrality, with the exception of Poland, where the preference is for a union alongside the United States in the event of a possible dispute with Russia or China. But even in Poland, 45% of the citizens would opt for neutrality. European sovereignty would require a form of neutrality and caution rather than any quest for power. European citizens want the European Union to be a strong and independent actor using a non-confrontational strategy. Contrary to the opinion of most politicians, academicians, the idea of a neutral Europe appeals to the peoples of Europe. European neutrality, like Swiss neutrality at the outset, finds its legitimacy is an internal, in an internal necessity. European strategic autonomy is clearly inconceivable without a convergence of the interests of the different member states. Neutrality would be the instrument of such a convergence. One conclusion is obvious, is obvious. In order to be seen as an important player and to deserve a seat at the negotiating table, the European Union's policy must change, come to terms with the emergence of global risks, take on more responsibility and ensure its defense because Europe cannot assume that the others will look after its long-term security. In a word, develop strategic autonomy. Becoming a political and military power would enable it not to submit to one block or another to better resist pressure, not to be subjected to, not to think into soothing, communicate based solely on the effects of words not to confine itself to a posture of passivity and immobility. In accordance with its values, with a real foreign and defense policy strategy endorsed by the citizens of Europe, a neutral European Union will be able to assert its ability to be different and independent in a changing geopolitical scenario. Thank you for attention.
Thank you very much, Madam President Kalmire, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you.